cannot foresee nor control the wrong use of any discovery, it cannot be denied that the progress of science has so far been overwhelmingly beneficial to the welfare of mankind. to James and Martha Rutherford in this small house in Spring Grove, New Zealand, on the 30th of August, 1871. The parents were hard-working residents of a colony scarcely 30 years old. Martha is a primary school teacher, and James is wheelwright and farmer, of rugged countenance and resourceful. These qualities would endure in their child Ernest, later Lord Rutherford of Nelson, at present the fourth son in a family of 12. The Rutherfords moved to Fox Hill. The children went to school where they might receive every opportunity despite their isolated situation. In fact, as the settlers of Nelson sought the better life, they were sure they could provide their children with an even better education. Again, the Rutherfords moved to the neighboring province of Marlborough. James hired a small boat which took them down the Pelora Sound and set up a flax mill at Havelock. Ernest went to yet another school. Has Ernest really been doing so well? He has indeed, Mrs. Rutherford. We should put your boy up for this Marlborough Educational Scholarship. If you think he has the ability. I do. And if he does well, he might even go on to university. out of 600 marks, Ernest Rutherford was placed in the fifth form at Nelson College. Without the scholarship, he would have become a farmer. Now, under the master W.S. Littlejohn, he was a most promising pupil and topped the school in most subjects. Strangely, his report neglected to mention the fact. English subjects, good. Classics, good in every respect. Mathematics, 85%, working steadily, has undoubted ability. Modern languages, Pronunciation neglected, but improving. General remarks, a very good boy from whom one may look for good results in the future. Signed, J.W. Joint, Headmaster, 1889. In later life, Rutherford the scientist reflected in watching the rapidity of this tide of physics, I have become more and more impressed by the power of the scientific method of extending our knowledge of nature. Experiment, directed by the disciplined imagination, is able to achieve results which far transcend the imagination alone. That disciplined imagination developed in Rutherford, the undergraduate in New Zealand, at Canterbury College, Christchurch. Here, along with a handful of other students, he gained his Master of Arts in Mathematics and Physical Science. But while others may have been content with just a university degree, he went further. In this small cellar, he was one of the first in the world to detect wireless waves. From 60 feet, the result of methodical experimentation. At the university, speculation was the exciting realm of his physics lecturer, Professor Bickerton. Apply the state of chemistry and physics to celestial phenomena. The suggestion made in this cosmic theory is that all temporary stars result from the grazing impact of 
stellar bodies. On impact, a new body, a third, is formed. Transmuted in a state of vivid incandescence. Whether in the complexities of the inconceivably minute... Concepts of the universe from the original and romantic mind of an old professor. A theory of cosmic impact stored in the subconscious mind of a young graduate and in later years, perhaps, revived by his disciplined imagination in the discovery of the atomic nucleus. For some, physical science was an arena for the wildest conjecture. For others, it was the closed book of completed knowledge. Professor J.J. Thompson was the head of the Cavendish Laboratory of Experimental Physics, Cambridge, England. In the 1890s, there was the pessimistic feeling, not uncommon at the time, that all the interesting things had been discovered, and all that was left was to alter a decimal or so in any physical constant. Had the great age of Faraday and Newton really come to an end? Within a year, a new physics would evolve. In 1895, Ernest Rutherford in Christchurch put forward the results of his work on wireless waves in application for the Great Exhibition Scholarship and became New Zealand's first overseas scholar. <laughs> For centuries, man could only imagine the minute atom and gaze blindly at the endless universe. Limited by his boundaries of perception. In 1895, Professor Ronchon detected the X-rays. Henri Becquerel discovered radiation. And Ernest Rutherford arrived at Cambridge. The right man at the right time. Today has been wet and cold, but I've had quite a gala day. In the afternoon, the Cavendish Society met. The professor invited me to go for a match of golf with him last Wednesday. Of course, I didn't know anything about the game, but the professor reckoned he could teach me. At Cavendish, Rutherford perfected the work on radio waves and turned to new fields. As he wrote to his mother, I've been working pretty steadily with Professor J.J. Thompson on the X-rays, and I find it pretty interesting. To his wife-to-be, he enthused, Don't be surprised to see a cable that yours truly has discovered half a dozen new elements. Discovered? He identified the alpha and beta particles in radiation from uranium. And having set the course of his life's work in nuclear physics, returned to New Zealand, where in 1900 he married Mary Newton and took her to Canada. In his homeland, the continuing progress in radioactivity at Montreal's McGill University seemed to bear little relevance. Only a lifetime of correspondence with his parents would link for them the nuclear scientist with the boy in the sounds at Havelock. I have been fortunate lately to hit on some rather interesting things. I have been working with the rare metals, uranium and thorium. Thorium behaves in a most erratic manner, blowing out some mysterious emanation. What is more, the emanation makes other bodies radioactive in contact with it. We believe that radioactivity is a natural process of atomic disintegration. Le 
recognize? The popular press lauded the Nobel laureate. But for the man in the street, atomic disintegration meant nothing at all. The implications even puzzled the scientists. In 1911, at Manchester University, Rutherford set off an experiment with his alpha particles and aimed them at the atom. And the microscope looked on as I made that gas conduct. A thin sheet of gold is placed in the path of a beam of alpha rays. Some entered the atoms, others were deflected, but some actually came back again. As surprising as if a gunner fired a shell at a piece of paper and the projectile bounded back. Bounded back. Now Rutherford had a theory of the structure of the atom. It contained a surrounding negative field of electrons and it had a positively charged nucleus. What an enormous power it must have indicated to Rutherford to scatter his alpha particles. For mankind, what boundaries of perception would be swept away by knowledge of this tiny microcosm of the universe? but I needed one after those last two games. I say, see that man across the room there? Uh, the farmer? Oh, farmer, nothing. That's Sir Ernest Rutherford. He plays with atoms a deal more casually than uh, you can play with billiard balls. We've a professor, a jolly smart professor, who's the rector of the lab in free school lane. It's quite an acquisition to the cause of erudition, as I hope very briefly to explain. In 1919, Sir Ernest Rutherford came back to the Cavendish as head and father of the laboratory. Crowds of enthusiastic young scientists flocked to Cambridge to work with the master. They even wrote a song for the occasion. What's in the atom? That's a problem he is working at today. He lately did discover how to shoot them down like flubber, and the poor little things can't get away. He uses as munitions on his hunting expeditions alpha particles which out of radium spring. It's really most surprising, and it needed some devising how to shoot down an atom on the wing. And their wondrous deeds can never be ignored Since they're birds of a feather We link them both together J.J. and Rutherford Left England on July the 25th for New Zealand To see the family and especially my mother and father Arrived on the Niagara in Auckland and was greeted at a civic reception by his worship, the mayor. The speeches went off well. It would be a semi-royal visit, a motor car at our disposal and free passes on the railways. After many travels, meeting friends and relatives, arrived at Taranaki to find my mother and father both very well and cheerful. I hope our stay did not put too much strain on them. Pleased that the family's children were a fine-looking lot. But on my journeying, disturbed that many forests had been cut down and burnt. More speeches in Wellington. And sailing south, saw I was coming within the home region. Havelock is very little changed. And after 35 years, arrived in Nelson. Lectured and was photographed. It all went off very well. At Christchurch, 
The university had decided that celebrations were to be the high water mark of doings in New Zealand. The next evening, I gave a formal lecture before a large audience, which went off without a hitch. Spent the last day in New Zealand at Wellington, searching the streets for the crew of our ship. To New Zealanders on his 1925 visit, there was nothing of the professor about Professor Rutherford. Then at Newnham Cottage, he received news of the death of his only child. He became a little older and more purposeful. It was now freely rumored that something new was underway at Cambridge and there was a peerage. Now, Lord Rutherford, honor more yours than mine, love, Ernest. Martha Rutherford was now aged 89 and she could be proud of her son. Gone the primitive apparatus, an advanced technology, the nuclear accelerator, and the neutron, fired by a 500,000 volt charge of electricity to split the atom. Ernest Rutherford died in 1937. Although he could never foresee the end of his work, he was certain that it could only be a beginning. <laughs>